Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Frat Demir from OU Center for Peace and Development, the Department of Economics and also Security and Context. Our distinguished guest today um, is Dr. James Boyce. Dr. Boyce is an Emeritus Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a Senior Fellow at the Political Economy Institute, uh, Political Economy Research Institute. He is the recipient of the 2017 Leon TF Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. He's also the author of 18 books and his most recent works include The Case for Carbon Dividends that came out in 2019 from the Polity Press and Economics for People and the Planet's Inequality in the Era of Climate Change that came out in 2019 from Anthem Press. We will have the Q&A at the end of the talk, but please feel free to post your questions on the Q&A window rather than the chat window. Um, and Jim, welcome. Uh, it's an honor to have Thanks, you here. Sir. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Yeah, I should clarify that those 18 books, I think you're counting some that I edited. But yeah, anyway, just wanted to make clear because the, the an impressive list. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I mean, when I say it's an honor, I literally grew up reading your work as a um, young grad student and then faculty. Um, so I'm really happy to have you here. And before it's further ado, I'll leave the camera to yours. Okay, thanks. We ready to go? Okay. Well, um, what I'd like to be uh, sharing with you today are some thoughts about climate change through the prism of inequality. Uh, climate change, of course, is occurring uh, globally, but it's in occurring in a world which is marked by very deep inequalities and those are both implicated in the way that climate change is unfolding and in uh, how we think about uh, the kinds of solutions that we should bring to bear in addressing the problem. Uh, there are two um, main sides of the injustice associated with uh, climate change. One is unequal responsibility for the problem, that is to say unequal emissions around the world. And the second is an unequal distribution of harm. I wanna to focus today mainly on the harm side, but I would say a few words about emissions. This is the picture that I think is in certain ways worth a thousand words in terms of showing which places are mainly responsible for the emissions from fossil fuel combustion in particular that have caused the problem of global climate destabilization. And as you can see, we're mainly talking about a problem uh, caused by the advanced industrialized countries. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it's very clear that uh, the people of Africa have contributed very little to the problem. This is a picture of the world at night taken from outer space. Uh, if we try to put some data on those numbers, this is a uh, map that uh, shows cumulative emissions uh, as of 2019 by country. And you can see that at this point, uh, the United States and China are number one. Um, of course, uh, in per capita terms, our emissions here in the United States still uh, have greatly exceed uh, in cumulative terms those of China. Um, what's happening uh, in brief, and I'm sure uh, most of the people listening will already know quite a bit about it, is that the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is causing global temperatures to rise, leading to a lot of climate uh, changes um, and climate irregularities, climate destabilization, I think is the best way to describe it. And this uh, graph from a recent report of the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, shows uh, different trajectories in terms of what uh, might happen in the future. And if we don't do enough to address the problem, uh, we're gonna be in for some really unbelievable uh, warming. And even if we do address the problem, we're going to have a lot of uh, changes uh, to which we need to adapt. Um, the harms from climate change uh, vary across countries. And this has to do partly with uh, climatological factors, uh, prevalence of drought, uh, risks of storm surges, 
um, associated with intensified hurricane activity, uh, problems of flooding. And uh, those inequalities across countries are exacerbated by differences in the capacity of countries to cope with climate change, which um, have to do above all with their levels of income. So as we can see, uh, when we look at risk adjusted for coping capacities, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are places that um, will be most severely impacted, even though these are places that have not contributed much uh, to the problem. What I'd like to then focus in on is how by uh, uh, thinking about climate justice as an objective, we can think about policies where we can both try to protect the climate and fight inequality at the same time. Rather than these be subject to some sort of trade-off, they can go hand in hand. And in particular, I'm gonna focus in on three uh, issues. One is the question of adaptation, which refers to steps taken to adapt to the climate destabilization that we fail to prevent. Some of that's clearly going to be necessary at this point, regardless of what we do to mitigate the problem down the road. The second is um, air quality, the co-benefits that come from uh, reducing our use of fossil fuels, which uh, improve public health and can improve environmental justice. And the third is the possibility of what I'm gonna call universal carbon dividends, which I'll go into in a few minutes. First, adaptation. The basic question here is adaptation for whom? Who is going to uh, be protected and who's going to pay for it? There really are two issues. One is who's going to come up with money to pay the costs of adaptation. And we know that however much money uh, the world comes up with, it's not going to be enough. The resources are going to be scarce, in other words, for adaptation. And the second, and the thing I'll really focus in on, is who and what will be protected uh, in our efforts to adapt to climate change. With regard to who will come up with the money, we have a framework set up by an international treaty called the UNFCCC, which provides that uh, countries should act, including pay for adaptation, in accordance with their common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. What that means is that the countries that have done the most to contribute to the problem and that are most capable of contributing to solution by virtue of their wealth should bear uh, the biggest uh, responsibility for uh, funding adaptation assistance. And there's something called the Green Climate Fund, which was set up uh, under UN negotiations, which uh, is designed to be a big pot of money by which the industrialized countries will assist developing countries in adaptation. Uh, the Green Climate Fund uh, is not adequately funded. The amounts pledged have been far below what's needed uh, for adaptation, and the amounts actually uh, uh, delivered have been far below what's been pledged. But we can look at the Green Climate Fund to get some sense of the issues about how the questions of adaptation for whom are going to be addressed. Uh, the Climate Fund's um, sort of operating framework uh, provides that funds should be um, distributed with an eye on efficiency and effectiveness. And a point I want to make uh, in this regard is that efficiency and effectiveness often mean different things. In um, mainstream or neoclassical economics, efficiency is guided by um, not only willingness to pay, but ability to pay. And so uh, the way that we measure um, what is a benefit from adaptation is to look at who can afford to pay for those benefits. In that framework, richer people and more expensive properties deserve more protection than poorer people and uh, less expensive uh, properties. And so um, that notion of efficiency is quite at variance with other notions of effectiveness that have to do with protecting people's lives and protecting people's livelihoods, regardless of whether they're rich or poor. This is an issue both within and among countries. So we can ask the question, who are we gonna protect in the United States? Are we gonna protect 
expensive real estate in our major cities? Are we going to protect poor people? The, the lower picture here shows people during Hurricane Kat Katrina in New Orleans in, 20, uh, in 2005. Uh, similarly, in developing countries, uh, will we protect uh, expensive real estate in dom downtown Mumbai, shown in the top picture, or will we protect poor coastal communities. In certain respects, it might be considered more efficient to protect that expensive real estate, but it might be considered more just and more effective in terms of saving human lives to concentrate resources on the most vulnerable communities. Um, in thinking about allocating limited allocation money, we can draw a contrast be, between what can be termed a wealth-based approach and what I'm going to call a rights-based approach. The wealth-based approach is embedded in a lot of neoclassical economics. I won't read through this whole quote, but I'll point out that the conclusion is that it makes economic sense to dump toxic waste in the poorest countries. Um, in a way, climate uh, hazards are another form of toxic waste. And the person who uh, wrote this memo, or at least signed his name to it, was a man named Lord Summers, who at the time was the chief economist of the World Bank. That's one approach to allocating resources, allocate them on the basis of wealth. And indeed, it's the way that real world markets allocate most resources too. A very different approach is to base it on rights, on the, on the basic premise that everyone has an equal right to a clean and safe environment, regardless of their purchasing power, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, and so on. And that rights-based approach is enshrined in the most foundational of legal documents in many countries around the world, including national constitutions like the post-apartheid constitution of South Africa, and including the constitution of my own state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Both have language articulating that rights-based approach as the basis for law and public policy. And these are rather different approaches. To bring out those differences, I think it's worth looking at how disasters have played out in the past. This is a picture from um, an island in Indonesia in the wake of the tsunami of 2004. And in the wake of that tsunami, the people of the afflicted areas, including in Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, were often afflicted by what uh, sometimes is called in the literature, the second disaster. The first disaster is when the natural disaster strikes, the tsunami in this particular case. But the second disaster is what follows afterwards when people who've been weakened by the natural disaster find themselves being dispossessed of their land, their homes, and their properties by others coming in to take advantage of their weakness, in effect, hitting them when they're down in order to grab their land. And particularly where the lands include uh, potentially lucrative beachfront uh, properties, that second disaster can be very intense indeed. We can already see in the name of climate change adaptation something similar going on in what uh, Kasia Propoki in the article uh, referenced on this slide has described as anticipatory ruination. In Southern Bangladesh in areas which stand to be very heavily impacted by uh, storm surges from intensified hurricane activity, there already are people being displaced from their lands on the grounds that this is adapting them to climate change, to the risk that their lands are gonna go underwater. But what's really going on is that their lands are being converted to shrimp farms, typically owned by wealthier people, including by military officers and others who are producing shrimp for export around the world. Um, that anticipatory uh, ruination, as she calls it, is an example of adaptation where what runs the, the kind of uh, guidelines for what's going on is the force of wealth rather than the uh, power of individual rights. Um, another type of so-called adaptation could be the construction of border walls to keep low-income people uh, and so-called climate refugees from intruding into protected spaces. 
And we can see something similar to that happening in the deployment of security regimes around the world, notably in sub-Saharan Africa, where it is anticipated that the um, uh, intensification of natural disasters associated with climate destabilization will require some sort of response. And the main form or one of the main forms that response would take is not trying to protect people from those disasters, but rather trying to protect uh, the West and um, powerful people from uh, the poor people who are bearing the brunt of those impacts. So under the guise of adaptation, we can see a lot of different things happening, some of them potentially positive for those who are most vulnerable, and some of them potentially negative. Finally, with regard to adaptation, I want to raise some issues associated in particular with agriculture and food security. In modern agriculture today, plant breeders conduct what sometimes is called a varietal relay race, race against newly evolving pests and insects, and increasingly against climate change as well, where they're constantly having to breed new varieties in order to keep up with the changing environments in which crop plants grow. The raw material for that varietal, reading, varietal uh, relay race comes from traditional varieties still maintained by small farmers in centers of diversity around the world. Um, losses of agricultural biodiversity are, however, going on in those centers, partly due to the spread of so-called modern agriculture, displacing those diverse traditional varieties, and partly due to international trade where cheap imports from the United States and other countries displace local uh, production, particularly by small farmers. The diversity that those farmers maintain in the field is extremely important for our ability to adapt to climate change in the future, however. And so this erosion of that genetic diversity is an enormous problem in terms of our future ability to adapt. The centers of diversity tend to be mainly in developing countries, as you can see in this picture. They're called Vavilov centers over the famous Russian biologist of the earliest, early 20th century, Nikolai Vavilov, who uh, posited these centers. Uh, there's a picture of him, and there's the uh, place in St. Petersburg where he had stored a lot of seeds, most of which have now died because of non-maintenance. Um, the paradox of food security and agricultural sustainability, therefore, is that in order to sustain our modern low diversity agriculture, we need a constant influx of new biological inputs, new genes from high diversity traditional agriculture, but that high diversity traditional agriculture is currently being undermined. So what we need to do in order to maintain our ability to adapt to climate change and to protect long run food security for humankind is to support the people who are the stewards of crop diversity in the field, like this kid and his family in the hills of Guatemala and uh, Southern Mexico, which is the center of diversity for uh, maize, or what we call corn in the United States, which is the number one crop in both the US and Mexico. Second, I want to turn to the issue of air quality co-benefits and environmental justice briefly. Um, when we burn fossil fuels, we not only release carbon dioxide, the most important greenhouse gas, but also a number of other hazardous air pollutants, including particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and a host of air toxics like benzene, for example. And the reason these matter is that when we're cutting CO2 emissions, we're also cutting these emissions of co-pollutants. We're getting what are called air quality co-benefits. And those benefits, research shows, are comparable uh, by conventional valuation metrics, at least, to the benefits of reducing CO2 itself. So it strengthens the case for moving aggressively to cut our use of fossil fuels. But the magnitude of those co-benefits varies across and within countries, meaning that in making choices about where to cut emissions, we're also making choices about where to have those air quality improvements.
When we look at premature deaths from outdoor air pollution around the world, these are data from uh, earlier in the uh, uh, almost a decade ago now, the numbers would have improved somewhat today, but not much for some countries. What we find is that the, there are enormous uh, numbers of deaths, um, millions of deaths, in fact, around the world from air pollution, uh, much of it resulting from fossil fuel combustion. Even in advanced industrialized countries in the United States, we're talking about tens of thousands of premature deaths every year. So by cutting our use of fossil fuels, we're not only going to help stabilize the Earth's climate, but we're also going to reduce these premature deaths. And for that, it's very important to think about where we cut emissions. Let me give you an example from the United States. Often it's said that it doesn't matter where you cut emissions because carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide. And while that's true, it does matter once we take into account co-pollutants and the co-benefits, air quality co-benefits from reducing emissions. So here are two sites in California which are comparable in terms of their total uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But one of them, a power plant near Bakersfield, is in a very sparsely populated area and it emits about 50 tons a year of particulate matter. The other an oil refinery near Los Angeles is in a very densely populated area, and it emits about seven times as much particulate matter. So in thinking about where we want to be cutting our emissions of fossil, uh, from burning fossil fuels, it makes a lot of sense to cut them in the oil refinery, in this case, rather than to be cutting them at the power plant. Um, it also matters from the standpoint of environmental justice, that is to say who is impacted by those hazardous air pollutants. And I won't have time to speak much about that today, though I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A. But if you're interested, you can find this report, which my colleagues here at Perry um, and I brought out earlier this year called Green for All, which looks at the integration of air quality co-benefits and environmental justice into climate policy. And our key findings are that if we only focus climate policy on carbon emissions here in the United States, we're going to get actual increases in co-pollutants in some locations with disproportionate impacts on EJ communities, on African Americans and Latinos. If we add the air quality and environmental justice goals into the design of our policies, however, we can get uh, big changes in where the emissions take place and we can do that at very modest additional cost and the benefits in terms of public health of doing so vastly exceed those costs. So there's a very good case in thinking about our ways in which we're cutting emissions, thinking about climate change mitigation, a very good case for taking air quality co-benefits into account, both from the standpoint of efficiency, not leaving public health dollars lying on the table, but also from the standpoint of environmental justice. Finally, I want to say a few words about universal carbon dividends. This again has to do with mitigation, with uh, policies to reduce carbon emissions. When we keep uh, carbon in the soil, when we keep oil in the soil or coal and natural gas in the ground, we're reducing the supply of these things to the market. And that is uh, kind of like what we do when we deal with traffic congestion. When we have parking lots and places that are too congested, we charge fees and we have rules and those limit the problem. So as part of the way we deal with parking congestion in cities around the country, we have parking meters on the streets. We also have rules about where you can park and where you can't park. You can't park by a fire hydrant, etc. cetera. Um, and that combination of prices and rules is how we deal with the problem of congestion. Uh, we, by charging for parking, it doesn't mean, by the way, that we've commoditized the streets or are selling the parking lots or the city streets. What it means is that use of our parking lots and our streets is no longer free. There's a cost that reflects the fact that there's a congestion problem. And similarly, when we think about climate change, it's a problem of congestion taking the form of too much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases 
being emitted into the parking lot of the world's atmosphere. And similarly, we need a combination of prices and regulations in order to address that problem. Why have carbon pricing as part of the policy mix? I think there's several reasons. One is, as I'll show in the next slide, a carbon price is an almost inevitable consequence of any cap on our use of fossil fuels. If we're actually going to limit the amount of fossil fuels we allow into our economy, um, it's going to raise the prices of fossil fuels, and that is uh, the equivalent of having a carbon price. Moreover, there are good things about having a carbon price, both in terms of the immediate reductions in emissions that result, and in terms of the long run effect of inducing demand side shifts, inducing more investment in energy efficiency and in uh, clean uh, and green energy uh, as a result of the rising price of using fossil fuels. And finally, and what I really focus on in these last few minutes, is the opportunity created by carbon pricing for capturing what I'm going to call the carbon rent in the next slide and using that money to advance the goal of reducing inequality at the same time as trying to cement public support for aggressive action to combat climate destabilization. So here's the one slot economic slide I'm going to show. And for the non-economists in the audience, I apologize. I know these graphs are, well, economists love them and most other people don't. But here it goes. This shows a market for fossil fuels. Uh, downward sloping demand curve. It's rather steep because demand for fossil fuels is what economists call it inelastic, people need them, they're necessities, not luxuries, and a supply curve. The demand curve slopes down as they get more expensive, people demand less. The supply curve slopes up as they become more expensive, producers supply more. What happens when we put a limit on the amount of fossil fuels we're taking out of the ground, a cap, or we keep the oil in the soil in the slogan of some of the climate activists. What we're doing is we're shifting the supply curve to the left. We're reducing the supply of fossil fuels. And what that does is it drives demand up that demand curve so that the price rises and the quantity consumed goes down. As you can see, the price rises more than the quantity declines because that demand curve is steep. It's inelastic. And that increase in prices uh, multiplied by the amount that's still consumed is what's called the carbon rent. It's the extra money that is paid for fossil fuels. That money doesn't just disappear, however, it goes somewhere. And what I want to drill down and think with you a little bit about here is where that money should go. First of all, though, who pays the carbon rent? the carbon rent gets paid by consumers. Ultimately, even if the cap affects uh, producers of fossil fuels or suppliers of fossil fuels, even if there's a carbon tax, which is uh, equivalent in many respects on the uh, suppliers of fossil fuels, that gets passed along to consumers as part of the cost of doing business. When you cut supplies, prices go up. You don't need uh, to be an economist to know this. Um, so how much do consumers pay? Well, it depends on their direct and indirect use of fossil fuels. By indirect, I mean fossil fuels embodied in other things they consume, like food and, and uh, other products. Um, in absolute terms, richer households pay more than poor households because richer households consume more fossil fuels and consume more of just about everything else. That's part of what it means to be rich. However, as a share of income in industrialized countries like the United States, poor households pay more on fossil fuels than do richer households. It accounts for a larger share of their family budget, their household budget. So in that respect, any price on carbon be it from a tax or from a cap, is like a regressive tax, a tax that hits the poor harder than the rich as a share of their incomes, relative to the incomes, even though in absolute dollar terms, again, the rich pay more. So that's where the money comes from. And that's a really big problem in terms of having any policies that limit the supply of fossil fuels and raise their price. It's a huge obstacle to that kind of policy. Now, in thinking about how to overcome that policy, that obstacle, 
we need to think about who gets the money. The money doesn't disappear. It's not shot to the moon. It's not buried in the backyard. It doesn't go to oil suppliers overseas. It's money that consumers are paying that's going to be captured by someone within the economy. Who? One possibility is to give the money to fossil fuel corporations. This is an option known as cap and trade, or more exactly as cap and giveaway and trade, because the idea is you give free permits to the corporations. That allows them to bring fossil fuels into the economy. They don't pay more for those fossil fuels, but they sell them at a higher price because of the scarcity induced by the fact that there's now a limit or a tax on the, uh, on the fossil fuels. And the fact that they got the permits for free means that they get windfall profits. Those profits get distributed in proportion to the ownership of corporate stocks, which we know is concentrated in upper income groups, and indeed some of them flow abroad to foreign owners of stocks. And some of the profits, therefore, flow out of the country to foreign shareholders. That's one option. A second option is what I'll call cap and spend. The money goes to the governments. In this case, permits are auctioned, not given away, or alternatively, there's a carbon tax with the money going into government coffers. So there's no need for permit trading in either of those cases. There's no cap and trade. Even if it's a cap, the permits are auctioned off rather than being given away. So there's no need to have firms trade amongst themselves after that. The revenue from the auction or from the tax is retained by the government and the money is used to increase spending on whatever the government wants to spend it on or to cut other kinds of taxes like income taxes or corporate income taxes or whatever. Uh, what the government actually does depends on the decisions of government leaders. The picture here is of John McCain and Joe Lieberman, who were the authors of a uh, cap and uh, trade bill that had a cap and spend component back in the first decade of this century. If you like uh, the government and trust what they're going to do with the money, this is an option that might appeal to you, but most people actually prefer a third option. And the third option is to give the money straight back to the people. This is called cap and dividend, or in the case of a tax, it's called fee and dividend. So in this case, the permits are auctioned, or there's a tax. The revenue is then recycled back to the people in equal dividends for every woman, man, and child in the country. The people who consume more carbon, which is to say upper income households, because they consume more of everything, pay more than they get back. And the people who consume less get back more than they pay. In that respect, car uh, carbon dividends protect the purchasing power of working families. Working families are held whole by the fact that the money's coming back to them. And indeed, low-income households, which of course many working families have uh, low incomes in this country, um, they, they come out with more money in their pockets than uh, in the absence of the cap and dividend or fee and dividend system. So that's another way to distribute the money. Paying out dividends is not rocket science. The state of Alaska already does this in something called the Alaska Permanent Fund. If you're not familiar with it, if you just Google it, you can go to the website of the Permanent Fund. You can see the one or two page PDF form that Alaskans use to sign up for their dividends. This is money that comes from extracting oil, not from keeping it in the ground. But the money, uh, these royalties on oil extraction are paid out on an equal per capita basis to every resident of Alaska. Um, the amounts vary from year to year, but typically they've come to between one and $2,000 per person in recent years. For high income Alaskans, that's a free shopping trip to Seattle or, or LA, but for low income Alaskans, and many Alaskans are low income, including many Native American Alaskans, um, that's a lot of money. For a family of four, we're talking about five, six, seven, even eight thousand dollars a year. So it's it's a lot of money, and as you can imagine, this is a very popular program in the state of Alaska across the political spectrum. Paying out carbon dividends would be no more difficult than it is in Alaska to pay out its oil dividends, and if Alaska can do it, we can do it too. 
The big difference, of course, is in the case of carbon dividends, the money comes not from extracting oil, but from keeping the oil in the soil. It comes from having a limit or charging a price for uh, carbon emissions and uh, capturing that money by auctioning the permits or collecting the tax revenue and reallocating to the people as dividends. That idea of dividends is consonant with a value that I think is pretty widely shared around the world, uh, which was summed up in this caption that I encountered on a mural painted by the great Mexican artist Diego uh, de Rivera at the Ministry of Education building in Mexico City. And in, in the, the way I've written it here is in the Spanish that uh, Rivera used himself in inscribing the caption on his mural. It says, the earth belongs to us all like the air and the water in the light and heat of the sun. I think a lot of people believe that that's the case. And if we believe that's the case, then that applies also to the Earth's limited absor absorptive capacity for emissions from burning fossil fuels. That capacity belongs to all of us. And if we're gonna not give that capacity away by not charging for it, but we're gonna limit the use of that capacity, limit use of that atmospheric uh, parking lot, as I described earlier, by charging for it, um, either through a cap or a tax, then that notion that it belongs to us all translates into the notion that we all should share and share equally in the revenue that comes from charging for something that we all own in common and equal measure. So I'll stop there, open it up to uh, q and I think uh, Firat, who's hosting this meeting, is going to be fielding the questions that you've submitted on the chat. I want to thank you all for listening. I'm happy to talk more about any and all of these topics. Uh, for those who are interested in reading more about these things, I've got suggestions here for uh, things you might start with in terms of reading about adaptation air quality co-benefits and, and environmental justice and universal carbon dividends respectively. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. This was really thought provoking and um, an insightful uh, discussion, especially when it comes to climate change and justice um, issues and social justice that comes with it. I will take the privilege of starting the question myself that I have to that that has been back of my mind for some time uh, one is um, you know in terms of the inequal distribution of the costs and benefits of the causes of climate change and as you have emphasized um, in many of your books and your latest work with also your quarters that six countries including the us china and other leading industrialized countries account for over 60 percent of uh, emissions cumulatively right since the industrial revolution started um, and countries take the whole African continent account for a very minuscule portion. I'm mean, stated it's three percent or less of total emissions have come in history from Africa. But even then, if you look at the discussions, including the uh, most recent climate summit in Scotland, that developed countries put this as a matter of charity, helping developing countries to tackle climate change. That also explains the lack, the inertia for helping the climate fund. Right? It's about charity rather than an equitable distribution of the costs by those countries that are responsible. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see a way out of it, like that debate being framed as a charity versus that actually this is what requires from an economic point of view that people will be paying for the true cost of their pollution for the last 200 years? Yeah. Well, it's as you're as you're suggesting. It's it's clearly not just a matter of charity. Charity is um, something that uh, you bestow on people who bear misfortunes that are no one's fault. But in this case, the misfortunes associated with climate destabilization droughts in sub-Saharan Africa, floods in certain places. Oddly enough, you can get both in the same country at different times of the year, um, vulnerability to storm surges and so on. Those are misfortunes that aren't natural disasters. They're really unnatural disasters that result from past activity. So claims of justice um, certainly would, um, would dictate 
that uh, those who have contributed the most to the problem have a responsibility to assist those who are currently uh, bearing the costs. Now that said, all we have to try to implement that uh, notion of justice is uh, are some fairly fragile international treaties, the most important being the United States United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that I, that I mentioned in my talk. In that treaty, the principle was accepted by the United States and by all the advanced industrialized countries, by all the countries of the world, the principle was accepted that the richer countries should do more by virtue of their responsibility for creating the problem in the past and by virtue of their greater capacity, their, their deeper pockets for helping people adapt to the, the problem, cope with the problem. Uh, but translating that principle into practice has been uh, a very um, difficult thing to do. And it really requires levels of political will that currently I'm afraid the, uh, has been in short supply, let's put it that way, in most of the advanced industrialized countries. And I don't think there's a lot one can do about that other than point out that um, the most serious impacts of climate change are being borne by people through no fault of their own. And um, we who have the capacity and share the responsibility for creating the problem really ought to think about this not as something happening to someone else over there, but something we have done to those people that we can and should try to um, uh, ameliorate through uh, helping to fund adaptation assistance. This issue applies not only internationally, as I suggested in, in, my, in my talk, Firat, but also within our own country, within all countries. We need to think about who's most vulnerable and how we're gonna make sure that adaptation assistance, that money to cope with climate destabilization is allocated in a way that um, goes to those who need it most and who did the least to create the problem. Thank you. Um, and my follow-up question is about the Green New Deal. Um, and we had talks and discussions at the CPD and SIC on this, especially whether we can grow ourselves out of the climate crisis. Um, your work, as well as uh, Bob Pauling's work from one of your colleagues, emphasized Green New Deal as one of the solutions. But the question is, do we have enough resources to produce and constantly replace solar panels, wind farms, the transportation network, automobiles, the batteries that are required to make them work, the insulation? Is it not the time to start talking about a reducing or discussing the limits to growth and making it in an equitable way, right? Talking about degrowth in Burundi with $300 a year income is a different thing than talking in LA or in, in the US with $65,000 a year income. But is it possible to actually to tackle climate change without changing our standard of living the way we are used to? The UN and panel on climate change right predicted that we need five earths to sustain the level of consumption in north america alone and we don't have that well i think um as i as i as i've written uh, firat um what we need to ask ourselves is limits to growth of what right what what are the limits what kind of growth uh do those limits apply to um we know that gross national product or gross uh, domestic product, national income, you know, e the size of the economy as mentioned, as measured uh, conventionally, which is basically measured by everything that has a price tag attached to it, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, that's a very poor measure of uh, economic well-being of the population. It's a poor measure because it misses a lot of things that are actually very important to our well-being, like clean air and clean water and, um, and uh, unpaid uh, caring labor. Uh, and it also includes things that are actually deleterious um, or that are the result of deleterious actions, like money spent on oil spill cleanups or money spent putting people in, in jail, right? So we know that 
GDP is not a great measure of human well being. And I think it's absolutely true that there are limits to growth on conventional GDP, but I don't think that necessarily translates into limits on growth in conventional well being. I think what we need to limit the growth of is the bad stuff that detracts from human well being. And we need to increase and support the growth of the good stuff, as well as distribute it more equitably within countries and between countries. And so um, that's where I think, um, in a way, the limits to growth slogan, which has been so popular in the environmental movement, since I was a college student, has really been, in certain ways, not particularly useful, because it's conflated growth of the good and growth of the bad. And in assuming that the good and the bad inexorably go together, it makes the same uh, false assumption that I think we often see from opponents of environmental protection, corporations and others who claim that, oh, if you're going to protect the environment, that's going to come at the cost of jobs and human well-being. I don't think that's true. I think we can create jobs and improve human well being by protecting the environment. And that means limiting our use of fossil fuels. It means limiting our use of other non renewable natural resources. It means limiting the amount of pollution we dump into the Earth's air and water. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean limiting and shouldn't, I don't think, mean limiting uh, the growth of human well-being. Most importantly, the growth of human well-being in the poorest communities around the world. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass it to the, the floor and we have a few questions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, so in terms of the redistribution mechanism, the question the, 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 the Tandy is asking, can we apply the same type of dividend distribution to globally, basically from developed countries who are responsible for most of the carbon footprint, including China, to other countries that are suffering from the impacts? So can we imagine a similar type of compensation mechanism from polluters to uh, sufferers or less polluters in, in, in terms of global economy? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, we can imagine it. Uh, and we can see that in certain ways, it would be both just and very desirable. Uh, however, um, there are two big obstacles to doing such a thing. One is that there is no international uh, government, no international fiscal authority that could administer such a system. And the second is that if one did administer such a system, if one figured out a way to do it, um, you would be in a situation where the majority of people in the advanced industrialized countries, including in the United States and in Europe, would be paying more in higher prices for fossil fuels than they're getting back as their share of the global dividends. And while from the standpoint of global uh, environmental justice, that would certainly be uh, potentially a good thing. From the standpoint of the political viability of a serious limitation on our use of fossil fuels that results in higher prices for those fuels, I think it would be um, a really, really uh, big problem, an insuperable problem. And so what I've advocated is uh, what I think of as a many baskets approach, that each country could and should implement its own carbon dividend policy, its own caps or taxes on uh, fossil fuels and redistribute that money internally. If we do that in every single country, we'll get the same outcome that the majority of people will come out ahead because income and carbon consumption are so heavily concentrated at the top of the spectrum and that there will be a progressive uh, shift of wealth from those who have outsized carbon footprints at the top of the distribution to a low income households in particular. So we'll make a big improvement in equity within countries. We'll make a big improvement 
in climate uh, destabilization by reducing our use of fossil fuels. Both of those are really important from the standpoint of international climate justice. But what we won't have achieved is that redistribution of resources from rich countries to poor countries that we talked about in response to your first question, Firad. The problem of um, getting the rich countries to pony up for uh, their, what I see as fair share of assistance to developing countries in coping with climate change. It doesn't solve all the problems at once, but at least it solves two of the biggest problems, which are reducing our use of fossil fuels by having the cap or the price on carbon and by reducing inequality within countries by recycling that money to the public. So it, this is a case where I think um, uh, what we can do is constrained by what is practically feasible to do. We don't have all the time in the world to deal with this problem. We've got to be dealing with these problems in the next few years and certainly in the next few decades. And so we can't wait for there to be global institutions that could manage such a redistribution or for the political will to emerge to make it possible at a global level. What we have to attack are the problems we can actually solve here and now today. Thank you. And a follow-up question with it is about, again, with the global disparities and who is going yeah. to be harmed and who will compensate. Yeah. I think a related issue um, that can't wait will be the climate refugees. Uh, we already have 80% or 80% of refugees in the world today are in poor countries. Uh, and the most recent refugee crisis from Yemen to Syria highlighted the importance of it, right? And, and I think that will be aggravated. And, um, and you have answered part of it. And the, the audience is asking, I'll say about the Glasgow meetings, if you are expecting anything to come out of it uh, or so far what has been become public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any silver linings in terms yeah. of going forward? Yeah. Well, um, let me first say a few words about uh, so-called climate refugees and then turn to Glasgow. Um, I think we have to be a bit careful in talking about climate refugees. Uh, the, the most serious refugee problems we see in the world today, including uh, the two you mentioned, Yemen and Syria, but also including the refugee problems uh, in uh, Central America, for example, are not driven by climate change. They're driven by uh, violent conflict and by poverty. They're driven by dispossession. These are the things that create refugees. That's point number one. To blame those refugee problems on climate change is in a way to almost naturalize them, to say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's no one's fault in particular, it's the fault of climate change, right? Um, and in fact, no, there are real actors uh, that have contributed to these refugee crises and have made money, I, I would have to say, uh, from the uh, conflicts and dispossessions that have provoked those crises. So we need to think about attending to the dynamics that actually create refugees and drive migration rather than to um, deflect them into um, thinking about uh, solving climate change as somehow uh, solving the world's refugee problems. Second point is that um, most uh, refugees, um, especially those who are affected by uh, climate change, who, for example, are uh, uh, migrating in response to rising sea levels or droughts or floods, um, insofar as such migration does occur, it's almost entirely within countries, not between countries, not across international borders. So in thinking about how to respond to those refugee problems, those internal migration and displacement problems that are really attributable to climate change and not to war and dispossession, there I think we again have to think about this as a form of adaptation assistance and about mobilizing international resources, particularly from the countries that can afford to help and have a responsibility to help, to help uh, deal with those, um, those displacements. Because it's certainly the case that some land is gonna go underwater 
uh, or, or be so frequently impacted by storm surges that people are going to move. It's certainly the case that some places may become too hot for people to live anymore, or too drought prone, or too flood prone. Some of that is going to happen. And uh, adapting to that is one of the, of the challenges that we certainly face under that heading of adaptation. Um, one last thing about climate refugees. I think one of the problems with attributing refugees to climate change and, and waving that climate refugee flag, which has been uh, quite popular among many environmentalists, I have to say, uh, but one of the problems with that is that it potentially feeds into some of those um, so-called adaptation measures that I referenced in my slides on border walls and on the security regime for um, sub-Saharan Africa, which involves basically deployment of troops, right? These are efforts to try to contain the problem uh, in the countries that are most severely impacted by climate change, not to solve the problem, but to contain it so that problem doesn't spill over internationally. And I think, frankly, that's a serious misallocation of resources. We ought to be allocating resources not to suppressing the people who are um, affected by these problems, but rather to assisting. Now, on to Glasgow. I think the jury's still out. Uh, the meetings, you know, it's st it's still still underway. Um, I am, uh, you know, as in so many cases, I, I hope for the best but expect the worst. I would say on the whole, my expectations are rather modest. Um, one of the reasons I would have to say that my expectations are rather modest is that not only are there the severe obstacles to international cooperation that we've already touched upon, but also within countries, there are have been severe political obstacles to really taking serious steps to cut carbon emissions. The pledges that have been announced are not enough, and the implementation of those pledges is also not enough. They're huge shortfalls. So we're uh, in store for some really serious climate destabilization unless we and other major emitters move aggressively to cut our emissions of fossil fuels. Now, moving aggressively, what does that mean? I think it means more than Green New Deal type measures, even though I support those measures. The focus of those measures has been on investments to reduce demand for fossil fuels, investments in energy efficiency, in building out renewables, in building mass transit, and so on. Um, I think it's important to make those investments. I think it's important to make those investments with an eye on creating jobs and on a just transition for workers in the industries that will decline as we move through the clean energy transition. People working in the fossil fuel industries and communities that have been dependent on fossil fuel extraction. These communities and workers have sacrificed a lot for our well being in the past, and it would be irresponsible not to attend to their needs in the course of this transition as well. But I think simply reducing demand for fossil fuels isn't enough. I think we also have to move aggressively to cut the supply of fossil fuels, to shift that supply curve, as I talked about uh, in my slides. And what that means is putting a limit on the amount of fossil fuels that we're going to burn, a limit that's consistent with stabilization of the Earth's climate somewhere within that 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius level above uh, pre-industrial levels that was agreed upon in Paris in 2015. Now, what does it mean to cut our emissions to stay within that limit? What it means basically is reaching something close to zero emissions or net zero by the middle of this century. Maybe we can you know, still be using some fossil fuels because we're um, making up for that by doing other things to sequester carbon and, and so on. There are possibilities for doing that, for what are called negative emissions. And those could turn out to be an important part of the solution as well. But basically, we need to be phasing out fossil fuels over the next 30 years, cutting our use of fossil fuels by something in the neighborhood of 8% per year. So what I've advocated is putting a ceiling 
um, on the amount of fossil carbon we allow into our economy that declines by 8% per year. And if demand for fossil fuels exceeds the supply limit set by that cap, then the permits to bring fossil fuels into the economy should be auctioned and the money recycled to the people as dividends. I think this is basically what we need to do in order to guarantee, to have any hope we're gonna guarantee that we stay within that 1.5 to two degrees Celsius limit. And one of the sad things I think about the current state of affairs in this country and in other countries is that very few people are talking about making such a guarantee by imposing a limit on the supply of fossil fuels. Instead, they're talking about measures to reduce demand, which again, I think are important. I'm all in favor of them, but I think we need to guarantee that we're gonna meet that target of reducing emissions at about 8% a year. And the only way I think we can do that is to restrict the supplies and face the reality that comes the economic and political realities that come with reducing those supplies. The economic reality being that if you haven't cut demand by that much, then prices are going to go up. And the political reality being that if prices go up, there's going to be a public backlash, as we've seen around the world, most notably in France in, this, in the Yellow Vest movement, but elsewhere as well. Um, and that in order to cope with that, in order to make sure that working people are held whole as prices go up. We need to have those universal dividends paid out to everybody in the country as their price of fossil fuels goes up. I just don't see any other way to do it. And what I'm sad about really is that um, politicians on all sides of the political spectrum really have been so terrified of actually seeing fossil fuel prices go up and facing the political at backlash because they haven't really cottoned on to the possibility of dividends as a way to deal with that problem, that instead of talking about cutting supplies, they instead talk about spending money, which is a lot more popular than anything that's going to raise prices to people uh, on various kinds of environmental good works. Again, I'm in favor of those environmental good works. I'm in favor of the Green New Deal. I think that's necessary, but I don't think it's sufficient. And so that's that, I would say, is my biggest disappointment in the current moment, really. I didn't expect New Resolve to, to deal with this to come out of Glasgow because I didn't see governments talking about it. The only way governments are going to talk about it are if people talk about it, if the kind of people listening to this lecture start talking about it and demanding that their leaders take action to limit the supply of fossil fuels and deal with the consequences. Otherwise, I don't think the politicians are gonna wake up some fine morning and decide, oh yeah, let's do this to save the planet and to reduce inequality. They're just not gonna do it unless we make them do it. Um, and we are almost over time actually, but I'll take one more question uh, and it's about the carbon charges. And the question is, um, there seems to be some, but are they close enough to where they need to be? And if there are any countries or any localities that use um, dividends regarding, uh, if you can follow. Yeah, up. yeah, both, both great, great questions. Um, and I'll try to give you a, a quick response. With respect to the actual levels of carbon charges today that sometimes take the form of carbon taxes and sometimes take the form of uh, caps with permits, um, no, the price levels that currently exist today are almost all way too low to have a significant impact on emissions. They can generate some revenues, which is good. Uh, some of them are used for environmental good works. That's good, but they're not big enough to have much of an impact. Um, there are a few exceptions. Sweden has a substantial carbon price. Uh, Europe is going to try to move towards a higher carbon price uh, over the next few years. But in general, the prices historically have been way too low to have much of an impact. That said, the fact that those prices now cover about 20% of carbon emissions worldwide is at least a first step. And it means that countries are developing experience with putting in place the instruments that could be used to achieve more robust emissions reductions. Um, with respect to dividends, 
the one country which has a real carbon dividend program in operation today is Canada. Um, Canada has it in all of the provinces that didn't already have a carbon price policy of their own before the federal policy went into effect in 2019, I think it was. Um, that includes Ontario, by the way, the most populous province, accounting for about 40% of Canada's population, I believe. They have carbon dividends. It's a federal government policy. Now, there are a couple serious problems with the Canadian system, even though at least they've they've managed to do this. Problem number one, the price is too low. Again, it's one where the prices are so low that really we're not talking about a hell of a lot of money. Um, problem number two is they chose to bury those dividends in income taxes. So that what happens is you get your dividend through a reduction in your income tax. Well, that's a place where it's so invisible the dividend that it's not really going to help in terms of people understanding and being able to compare the dividends they get to the prices they pay, the higher prices for fossil fuels that they would pay as a result of a carbon price. I think it's very important that the dividends not be buried in income tax rebates or anything of the sort. The dividends could should come as a dedicated, you know, the metaphor is a check in the mail. Nowadays, of course, most of these are electronic transfers into people's bank accounts, like the stimulus checks that we saw in the last a uh, year and a half during the COVID pandemic, paid into people's accounts. People can see it. They know how much money's there uh, and they can compare that to what they're paying at higher prices. Uh, if you bury it in the tax system, look, I have a PhD in econ economics. I can't even figure out the tax system. I have to have an accountant to do my taxes for me. It's so complicated. Same thing, I can't figure out my electricity bill. You don't want to bury it in the electricity bill. You want, which they do in California to a limited extent, by the way. That's another place where there's a dividend light component only. It's not per person, it's per customer and so on. But um, I think what's really important is to have the money come back in a way that's not only fair, but is highly transparent, highly visible, because it's that return flow of the carbon rent that's going to help to guarantee durable public support for strict measures to limit carbon emissions, even in the face of rising fossil fuel prices. And we'll have to stop it there. Thank you, Jim, for a great talk. And thank you all our attendees for uh, staying with us for the afternoon. And good, have a, a great day for the rest of the day. Bye. Thank you all for coming. And we can wait until um, people quit. Uh, Stephanie, are you in the background?